At Collins Morgan, we offer friendly, regulated and ethical advice for anyone living in Scotland. Over the last six years, we have helped thousands of Scottish residents become debt-free. Our organisation always have your best interests at heart and our advisors are trained to help you in any situation with a range of solutions always available. If you're struggling with debts, act now and call one of our friendly advisors on 0141 218 4450. Boom, we're on. Hey. Right, we're on. In today's guest, we've got Mark Dempster. How are you, brother? I'm good. I'm good. Good I'm to good. see you. Yeah, good to see you. Travelling so all the way up to London Aye. to be here. Yeah, no, appreciate it was, that. No, definitely. It was a good. It was a good thing to do. And I, and you know, obviously, from I got in touch with you just last week, and uh, and it was through Paul. Paul Ferris yeah, had, had been on and stuff, and he says, "Oh, you should contact." Mm -hmm. And you know, so it's good to be here. And now you're here. Yes, man with. Addiction problems, been in prison, yeah. to now having one of the best clinics in Harley Street, London. Yes. Rubbing shoulders with the big names and yeah. you've done amazing with your life compared to where you've been from, addicted to heroin, crack, yeah. Valium and now you're running a show down Harley Street. And <laughs> well, I don't know about running yeah. the show. But <laughs> well, no, yet, no, yet. <laughs> um, no, yeah, no, yeah. Incremental stages. <laughs> and you've also what? given me your two books today, The right. Ongoing Path and Nothing to Declare. Yeah. Where can people get these books? Oh, they can get them on Amazon. So they're, uh -huh. they're, they're they yeah, get them on Amazon. We'll touch on them few, anyway. Aye, sure, no worries. Addiction no worries. about all addiction. Uh, well, one of them's a biography. The first one's a biography, just about my story about how I got from from addiction into recovery, really. And the second book, there, the ongoing paths, just all about it's a self help book. So it just yeah. talks about all the various addictions and how to get help, and it gives practical exercises of how to deal with addiction, um, uh, addictive patterns, and how to break them and. You know, so that's just, yeah, mostly self-help. Love it. So, right back to the start, Mark, right, okay. where you grew up and how it all began. Right, okay. So, I grew up here in Glasgow, Partick. Uh, I was born in uh, Purden Street, actually, in, in the centre of Glasgow. Um, and I went to a school called St Peter's. I was my father. Uh, so, my fam the family history really was that my father struggled with alcoholism you know he he was an alcoholic it, it, it developed in him over the years uh it, it, there was a bit of petty crime in the family really not not serious crime but a bit of petty crime uh my mother was like from a convent really she was like sort of i grew up in in france in a convent and uh had quite a sort of good education but really strict you know sort of militant sort of nuns running a convent and um, so I was a lonely child. I was a lonely child. It was only me. And uh, what started to happen, I guess, is as a young kid, my father was because of his alcoholism. He was he was sort of like he was sober for a, a period of time, and then he would slip again. He, he sometimes went to fellowships. He went to twelve step fellowships, and he would. Uh, he'd stay sober for a bit of time and then he would slip again. He'd go right back into the sort of madness. He'd have terrible uh, accidents, really. He fell in a, a, a bucket of tar one time. He, 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 he crashed a car when he was really, when he was younger. His best friend in the car died. Um, he got a solicitor, a, a really good solicitor at that time here in Glasgow called George Beltrami. And so... So I grew up with with the sort of influence of my dad, um, and and some of that was to some degree that because he because he sometimes steals stuff you know in front of me and and uh, just because I think he'd be, he'd be pissed he'd had a drink or so and he'd, and we'd be in a shop and he'd say would you want like I remember being in Woolworths and pick like seen some guns like plastic guns and he says do you want one of them and I says yeah and he just picked it up and put it under his his coat and walked out with it and. I remember as a kid, adrenalised, feeling really adrenalised because of the fear, because I knew it was wrong. I knew it was like, you shouldn't be doing it. So it was like in that sort of shame or just adrenalised and fear that yeah, he's going to get caught. That. Yeah, I, I guess that's the early thing. And then, and my father used to steal a lot of cars. So he used to joyride because he got banned from driving. So he'd, he'd steal a car 
uh, one time he stole actually a police car and 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 a, a CID car years later when we lived in Helensburgh. So, so I'd, I'd be in the back of these cars sometimes, and I'd be thinking, you know, what's you know, we've not got this car, but all of a sudden I'm in this car, and uh, he'd be sort of drink drinking, and and so that was without I don't I don't want to demonise my father in any way, but he 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 really suffered, you know, from his alcoholism, but eventually he got sober. Uh, the last 14 years of his life and I'd done his eulogy and we made amends and we had a really good connection. So fast forward, I sort of grew, uh, sort of grew up, we moved to Helensburgh when I was about 11. I was always attention seeking, so the, the, the key component really, if I look back, was from a young age, I was always looking externally from a buzz outside. I was always trying to get, like, I was attention seeking really, uh, looking to be validated so as a kid we used to jump across the like the middens really at the back of the tenements and and we'd be jumping over these roofs and stuff and the other guy the other boys would all be like oh Dem's, my nickname was Demi so they used to go Demi will jump Demi will jump between the, that gap and uh, and I would be like so desperate for the attention I'd do it I'd just jump even though I was really frightened mm -hmm. I just do it, and then when I landed on our sides and it came off, and everybody went, "He's he's he's mental, he's fucking mental." I would I'd feel that buzz, that hit from which wouldn't of course last. It only lasts uh -huh. for a small, but then you'd have to keep on doing it, and then fighting as a kid, always fighting. That we sense of importance that people are. They think they like you, that you're getting that attention from them, but really you're just making an ass of yourself to yeah. make them laugh. They're not laughing with you, they're mm. laughing against you. Mm. But mm. you think that buzz came, obviously, your dad, you were a reflection of your dad, who obviously craved that attention as well. Yeah. Maybe said he's mental, he's out stealing cars, he's oh, out he's, joyriding, mm. he's shoplifting, and he gets that adrenaline and kick where you've just passed that on and you think, that's normal to do. Yeah, and also also that, just because underneath it was shame, really, shame and not feel it. So, so the attention externally, I'm looking for the attention externally because I couldn't get the attention when Internal. I was younger, right? So, so, so as a kid, as, as we sort of, as children mature, if they get their developmental dependency needs met, this is what I understand from studying, but if you can get those needs, those emotional needs met, I mean, it's not perfect. No, there's no perfect family. But if there's a sort of sustenance and, you know, a, a continuity where the child knows that they're validated and they're loved and they're, they're valued, really, then they become internally, they become that I am enough. They tell, internalise and they say to themselves, I am enough. I'm a good person, you know, I'm a good person, I, I'm of value, so they don't really need to look for it outside, because their self-esteem is, their self-esteem is quite robust, but children who have been neglected in any way, are emotionally neglected, and I know it's like, without, and I don't want to sound at all victim here, because it's not like that, but where there's that, where you're, they become, they start looking for it outside all the time, and of course, it's like a, they're like, a fruit on a tree that's ripe for addiction because at some point the attention will change to if they find drugs or alcohol they'll they'll go into that destructively as well because because it will numb them it will take them away from themselves so I started to that's pain yeah pain it's all about it, yeah it's all about you, you, you know an, an an emotional unmet needs really and the pain that that at the core of that, what's the, the, the core of that yeah, is yeah. codependency. They say about having a chemical imbalance as well. Do you know yeah. about a chemical imbalance? Yeah, yeah. Well, they where... say, they say, yeah, yeah. Well, they say, James, that uh, now they're able to see through fMRI scanning of the brain, they can see that people with addictions produce less dopamine in the brain than people that don't have addictions. So they can see that there's a dope. In fact, in the States, they call it dope dopamine deficit syndrome. So they produce less dopamine. They also, the part of the brain that deals with stress, that that's impaired as well, and impulse control. So the three areas, in fact, Russell Brand and Professor Nutt done a documentary about that and said, you know, like they could identify that, you know, the three areas that, that that were impaired is that so the chemical imbalance the the predisposing factor genes to like if you if your family you've got a lot of addiction in the family obviously those genes are passed on to you so not necessarily you might have an addiction but you've got a predisposing factor a gene and if you just then combine early exposure to drugs or alcohol 
plus some trauma or emotional neglect, you've got like the perfect storm mm -hmm. for addiction to really... To, for the days to kick Yeah, off. to really cultivate mm -hmm. that addiction. It's weird that I always speak about it. It can pass down from generation to generation in your DNA. Yeah. But again, the mind's so powerful. I was watching something, a guy called oh, yeah. Dr. Hamilton, David Hamilton, okay. Scottish guy. So he did a study on people who play the piano. They had a, yeah. um, one physically playing it and one mentally, right, one men, one seen, mentally yeah, yeah, playing yeah. it. And they, they done it for, I think it was five days consistently yeah. for two, three hours. And the ones mentally just visualising playing it. With, they actually, when it came for the ones who visualised that, were playing it the exact same way as the ones who were doing it yeah. physically. So in their brain, they were mentally just playing the piano. Right. Absolutely. And learning how to play it. And yeah. by the end of the five days, they were playing just as good as the ones who were actually playing it for the two, three hours a day. It's, it's the, fascinating, the, isn't the it? The brain is a fucking mental thing. It's, it's crazy, isn't it's it? It's crazy. Because that, they, they, they done it also with guys eating apples in the States. They, they, they were eating apples and they, they, they put them up, they put fMRI scan and they could see the exact same parts of the reward mm -hmm. system, the brain being activated with the people that were just imagining eating an apple. So so lots of it is... So he's basically saying, yeah, yeah the, uh, the brain does not know from yeah. real or fake. It doesn't know from um, what's real or what's imaginary. So yeah. it's all down to it. Again, the mindset that really fascinates yeah. me and, and yeah. I love it, mate. I know, it's crazy, it's crazy. Isn't it? So yeah. where did you all start? So, so then, so the, yeah, so then, right, if I, if I go on to the, the, what started to happen. So first, I think the behaviour, the addictive behaviour, really, if we, if we looked at what was the actual... Because... Uh, if we take drugs or alcohol or gambling or sex, whatever the addictive process is, is the symptom really. So what, you know, they, that's the outward symptom, but what's at the core, what's at the root of that really? So where did it begin then? So it began in that, but what we're talking about is the looking for attention, looking for this sort of validation, feeling a void, feeling that sort of vacuum inside, being incredibly self-critical as well as a child, you know, like always like the mind just having not any means to emotionally regulate, to be able to control your emotions, not being able to even speak about uh, your emotions as well, because, you know, and especially then, I guess, in 60s, 70s, Glasgow growing up, and, you know, your ego and people, how, you know, there could be a lot, you could have a lot of problems, you know, there could be, you know, we were we were like always, we don't mention anything outside the house, really. You know, if your dad's in prison, we just say to the neighbour, oh, he's working on the rigs or he's, you know, like, so there's a whole thing around secrecy and therefore shame that creates shame that you can't, you know, so if you push, if you're if you're living a life where you're already, when you're young, starting to have secrets and tell lies, really, that's the sort of beginning of some of the behaviour that's going to sort of haunt you later on, really. And, and then I... I Moving forward, my first ever, because my dad was an alcoholic, I thought there's no way I'm going to, and he did say to me when my young age, he says, look, there's a good possibility that you have a predisposed, you, you'll have some such. Was he aware of all that stuff? I, he was, even back then he says, he says, look, my, cause, cause my grandfather, not on my father's side, but on my, my grandfather on my mother's side was an alcoholic as well. So I had like my father's side and my mother's side that had alcoholism, really. They would have been using drugs back then, but there just wasn't really drugs. There was, like, over the counter, there would be prescribed drugs that they would use, Valium or something. That lots of people were addicted to back then, and Valium, mother's little helpers, and and um, and Valium and Librium. But, so he had an understanding that it's likely that it will be passed on, there'll be some sort of genetic influence. So he'd say to me, just be really mindful that later, later on, but... I had it in my mind that because it was so, like, witnessing living with an alcohol... Like, as a kid, I became a little caretaker from really young, hiding my dad's whiskey, putting it, stashing it away, locking, trying to lock the door so that he can't get out. Um, was he violent so or anything? Or was he, it he did get violent, yeah. He got yeah. aggressive. He got really violent later on. Late, later on, as I started to get older, I think he got more violent because I think underneath he was quite jealous over the relationship I had with my mum because he was, uh, because he 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 had a really bad accident and he lost his memory and his speech mm -hmm. and he sort of reverted almost to, to a, bit, a bit like a child and I became like the parent in a way. Looking after him. I, and, my, and my mum, I guess she was like, she would like speak to me a lot about what's going on, and and I think that he, he was he was jealous over yeah. that relationship. A lot of people with addictions or mental health, 
you'll tend to see that they're that those are the ones who are most jealous, who are ones who most crave love. And if the people mm -hmm. who they love don't give them it back, that's when the abuse comes in maybe physically because yeah. they can't handle the fact that they're losing a loved one or that they can't get their attention because they've lost yeah. that attention span of it's it's difficult addictions, you know that yeah. yourself. It's really difficult and I was a very jealous person. Yeah. I, I was too much pride and so for me as well to have addiction, drink, drugs, gambling, womanizing. Yeah. What was that? What, what would you say that the majority of that stems from when you're younger? This, it, it, it start to get it's to, it's to fill that void. I think it's to fill, but also obviously we've got to say that it's a buzz in it as well. You know, like when you were talking about my father being uh, aggressive and I'd, I got adrenaline as a child. I I started to at the start he would attack, so he'd be drinking about his head and he'd, he would attack me. I'd always keep my shoes on. I'd never would take my shoes off. I'd always want to be closest to the door, like so. I have a seat. So as a child, my brain was already getting wired, getting adrenalised. The amygdala was starting to get hyper aroused, really. And what was happening is those first incidences where I'd have to run out the house, like just in my socks or something, because they'd be chasing me. When I when I got away, I'd feel the buzz of of escaping, and I'd feel the high from from that nearly being caught. Is that fight or flight? And that's the fight or flight stuff. So then I start then I'd start to provoke my father so at the beginning he would be doing it and then I'd start to provoke him because I was looking for that so there's no uh, you know there's no there's no doubt that some of my behaviour even today my 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 sense of being addicted to danger like I still you know like I do paragliding I, I ride fast motorbike you know I've, I've got a Harley now but I had a fat uh, before it got stolen I had a little sports bike when I'm when I'm going say over a hundred mile an hour on a on a sports bike, and that feeling that I get where I could die at any moment, right? The the fear of you're that. Do you replace that with your dad then? Yeah, that goes. I think that goes back mm -hmm. to those initial imprints from my kids of of like feeling really alive because you're getting a massive hit. You know, if you think it, if you're thinking that you're going to get killed, you know, like yeah. it's all predator oh, days, yeah, isn't yeah. it? We, if we, we, when we were hunter gatherers, mm -hmm. when we were out there, like in the savannas, like, and a wild animal would come, we would be, we'd run like, fuck, like rate of knots and we'd get away. If we got away, we'd be like, whoa, we'd Adrenaline. get that hit, the dopamine hit, the dopamine high. So that translates, so the, the reward system gets hijacked really by that behaviour. So therefore just normal pursuits in life, like just say maybe not been on the motorbike at 60 mile an hour or 70 mile an hour, doesn't really do it for you. Do you know what I mean? Like, so that's something to be really mindful of. And especially as you get older and you've got responsibility, you know, like mm -hmm. I've got children now, they've never seen me they've never seen me take a drug they're 14 yeah I should say about that that now I'm 22 years I've no used drugs and alcohol mm -hmm. so even although I've no used drugs and alcohol for 22 years you've replaced I, it with I, 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 well you could I but I've replaced it with probably a, that that sort of because there's real positives to addiction as well to having an addictive personality they're, they're usually a lot of sports people, a lot of musicians, a lot of actors are have got addictive personalities, but they've channeled that addictive drive, that tenacity and resilience and that sort of dedication and the obsession around when you want to be successful, yeah. you know, say it's, it's copying your lines or, or doing a part or playing an instrument they've became obsessive and the productive, they've used it so and the creative. Right yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's but, not necessarily uh, a bad thing, the same as no, it's good. Yeah. with you yeah. being clean, you've you've become an adrenaline junkie where you're craving that, you've still, <laughs> you <laughs> missed that buzz where you're, you're getting it, which is a good thing because uh, you're yeah. not doing it in a yeah. bad light, yeah, you're doing yeah. it in one no. where you still crave that adrenaline because uh, yeah. you've not got your shoes on ready to run out the door uh, thinking, uh, yeah. right, I could get killed here or yeah. what's going to happen tonight, how drunk is he going to be, you've replaced it with, I'm going to get my Harley and bomb it. I I'll get mine along the motorway. I <laughs> yeah, but, but but then but then again, James, I've got to be really mindful around what's appropriate. You know, like as as regards, like it's a good like the paraglide now, be good. But also, I've got to think now as I've got older and I've got responsibilities. Look, I've got two children. I've got to be like a responsible father. I can't be doing stuff that I would have done maybe at the start of my recovery when it was just me and I was only accountable for, for my life, really. So there's a maturity that that has had to happen as well as I've went on. Otherwise, I'll create, I've got the potential to create harm. I, I can, you know, that 
I can create, you know, just by being irresponsible or something. If I go up paragliding, it's too windy or something, and you know, and I get pulled up and I get hit by a thermal, and I keep going up and up, and I can't get back down. The adrenaline be pumping. Adrenaline be pumping. Two miles. <laughs> up, you know? I mean, there's a plane just about it. You know, dopamine as well. So for people watching, dopamine. What is dopamine? Dopamine's a, dopamine's a neurotransmitter mm. and it's, it's so it's a chemical in the brain and what happens is that we produce naturally you know like dopamine like serotonin noradrenaline we produce these natural endorphins endor aye, exactly so we produce them naturally in our body but what happens is certain drugs especially like if you look at cocaine say for example cocaine hij hijacks the dopamine system in the brain so what it does is when you say a sniffer line of coke I come up, I get that. I mean, this is the thing. It's the law of diminishing returns with cocaine as well because I could do a talk just about the individual drugs. But I, but uh, so what happens is you take, I take a line of coke and I come flying up right on that when it kicks in, when it goes through the nasal membranes and you get in it and it kicks into the, the reward system. But what happens is that just floods, my brain gets flooded with dopamine just in that, you know, a massive amount of it. And what it does, the reuptake valve of the brain gets shut off. So it just keeps all the dopamine in that part of the brain. That's hence why people feel really good for maybe 30 minutes or 35 minutes because they've got like the brain's just like produced so much dopamine, but it's holding it. Whereas normally the brain just releases that dopamine. So, so we get a dopamine, say something happens or we, we, we say the two years run out, we come out here and we run 100 yards and, you know, we get that little bit of dopamine right away from that gym activity really or that exercise but we'll start to come down a wee bit, but, but cocaine, but so, so the dopamine thing, obviously, you, you know, if, if your brain naturally, and this is back to that, you know, the chemical stuff, mm -hmm. you know, disability, sort of chemical dysfunction or disability, if, if the brain produces less dopamine, right, dopamine works in a way, it, 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 it's not just a feel good factor, but it also lays down memory and it provides meaning and purpose in life. So it's not just the feel good factor, it's like, it's a lot, it's a lot more than just, just that, that buzz. So if I'm producing less dopamine, what happens is I'm going to be slightly depressed most of the time, unless I can think. So when I'm clean, so when I, when I'm completely clean, if my brain is disabled slightly and produces less dopamine, I have to find a way naturally to get a dopamine, to, to lift my dopamine levels. So hence why loads of people, when they get clean, they go to the gym a lot, mm -hmm. they do, they, or they find or, or, or activities Podcast. or career or mm -hmm. podcasts or whatever, you know. Or they replace it with something else. And that's where you gamble as well, it releases dopamine. Oh, that's why gamblers. where people stay on addictions mm. because they're craving that dopamine buzz, they're craving that hit where they feel good. Yeah. But once that goes, again, it is replacing that. Exercise is a massive key. When you spoke about I, serotonin, I, this is what fights anxiety, fear, yeah. all the bad stuff, endorphins, the feel good factor. Even for people maybe a bit overweight, get out a walk, go on nature and yeah, you'll get these, these natural chemicals where you feel good. But they only last for a, a short blast as well. That's where you must keep doing them, yeah. which is difficult. Yeah. But again, it's, to touch on these subjects, it will help a lot of people to understand right. it a bit better. Because I speak about a lot of it, but I'm no yeah. studied. I'm just learning the craft and understanding it a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I can speak about it. Because when I speak about it sometimes, I butcher it. Because yeah. sometimes I'm like, that doesn't <laughs> fucking sound right. It sounds right in here, but when I speak it, I go, ah, I'm yeah, just yeah. fucking murdered that there. <laughs> so when did you start getting I, into the, so it, I, the, the heavier, heavier stuff, drugs? The drugs. Okay, so I started with alcohol first and then, I, you know, my first uh, my first experience of alcohol was there was a can of special brew, you know. It was, it was not glamorous. It wasn't yeah. like, it didn't start glamorous and it didn't end. Age? And, and so I, I would have been 13 or so when I took a can of special brew. I remember it really well because I remember like we used to, I used to have an air rifle and I used to shoot the English sailor. I mean, for any English people are, are listening to this, I, 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 I don't shoot English that, sailors now. Just and, 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 and I, I, I lost my mind. <laughs> but we used to, I remember I used to have an air rifle, a BSA, make you or air rifle and I used to like, because I was living in Helensburg and there used to be loads of English sailors that used to, you know, in the, in the town, they used to, like at night time, when they were all walking up the road, pissed, I would, I'd shoot, shoot them from a window. I remember this first night taking the can of special brew and I, I remember feeling, abs I remember saying to myself, uh, this must be what it feels like to be normal 
so obviously I was thinking at that, even at that age, I was thinking that I was sort of abnormal or alien somehow, that I didn't fit in. I felt really clumsy. I felt shy. As a kid, I, I would always feel really unattractive as well, physically unattractive, that I'd always be looking at my nose. My nose is too small. You know, like I'd always be like looking at my features and sort of self-obsessed, really self-obsessed. And, and so with alcohol, that sort of like that feeling that I got gave me that sense of it, confidence. It, it, confidence. I right away, it gave me that. I, I just didn't care. And, and my mind then shut up. That negative committee in my mind that, you know, because <clears throat> it is like a committee. It's like different, without sounding completely schizophrenic, but the, the voices in my head just shut up really and I stopped beating myself up I stopped it like and and I was numb I, and and I felt that that feeling of not and but yeah I, I hated alcohol because I'd witnessed what it done to my father I'd witnessed what it done to my sort of my uncles and stuff as well and then a few years later uh, in school some of the guys some of my friends in class were starting to smoke dope um they were like, I was 15, say, I was really curious. I had like a real, if I look back then, it was inevitable that I was going to, I was going to be an, a, a, an active an addict. addict because I was so curious about, about what they were doing because they were smiling, they were stoned, they were coming into class. And then it was a matter of time, and then I smoked some dope. And I remember even at the time when I first started to smoke dope, uh, I remember thinking, I'm only going to do this at the weekend. I'm only going to do this yeah, at the very yeah, beginning. The same shit chat. I, I, you say one I, night, I, a month, and this and I, that. But I, I, for addicts, it. people who get diseases, I, we don't do one night. No, no, one night. It doesn't we like, don't do one line. We don't I, do one beer. I, that's it. Right. Because we're craving that that yeah. feel-good factor that, to shut the demons up because Aye. that takes you away from your pain. Oh, 100% worse the next day. But again, that stems from your yeah. father, I don't know, here to I, no, shoot no, down not your dad, but no. these are, I, these are the, the, the steps the, to I, these addictions to maybe getting yelled at all the time, ready to leave the door, yeah, and yeah. that stems for, right, I'm not good enough, you're this, you're that, you're a no use, you're blah, 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 it's yeah, a, absolutely. It's a constant thought, so if you drink, take drugs, it shuts their voices up, and that's... Oh, completely, so, uh, completely. Yeah, definitely. And then it was, then it was the odd drugs at the time, everybody used to take mushrooms, acid, there was LSD, a lot of LSD, so bit by bit, even though I'd said... I'd said in my mind, I'm never going to take anything harder than this. I'm never going to, I'd never take heroin. I'd never take crack cocaine. You know, well, crack cocaine was, yeah, well, free base cocaine was around, I guess, at that time. But, but through time, you know, and quite quickly, really, I crossed all those barriers, right? So everything that I said I wasn't going to do, I soon, you know, within a couple of months, really, I was like, taking the mushrooms I was taking acid I was taking these things called dodos they were like speed tablets like you used to get in chemists uh, and then eventually I, I took every single drug but it was a but what what I was was I was obsessed with even cannabis when I first started to smoke harsh or weed ha aye, it was harsh because skunk wasn't around there see Skunk never, it's quite a relatively new thing, isn't it, Skunk? Well, I'm saying relatively new in the last 15 years or 20 years, but in, in Amsterdam, you've always done a lot of skunk. But but it, it was just dope. But I, I remember getting this book called The Great Books of Hashish, and I'd, I'd look at this book, and it, and it told you all the countries where the hash came from, like Morocco, Lebanon, Lebanon, Turkey, um, India, Pakistan. And I remember, like, as a kid thinking, I'm going to go... I'm going to go to all those, like, I'm going to go to some of them countries because they're big, really glamorous pictures of, right, big bits of hash and, and all, like, <laughs> like shiny and, 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 and a story about this particular hash. How good that is. Uh, exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. The Royal Nepalese, I'll never forget Royal Nepalese temple balls. It was like a, like it, it was it was used by the kings and queens of, of Nepal and, and, you know, it was like, it was... You know, there was this whole sort of glamour, this fable, mm -hmm. this myth about the whole thing. Made that, it well, small. I just say, mm -hmm. I, yeah, yeah. And 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 what happened is, I did go to those, I did go to those countries that, hence why, starting to smuggle and stuff like that. But that was a bit later, and uh, I came to. So what started to happen is I came away from Glasgow when I was twenty years old. Well, I came, I moved, moved to Helensburgh when I was eleven, and then when I was uh, twenty, I, I got. I went to London and then because of my because of the uh, growing up as a Catholic really in Glasgow my uh, supporting Celtic I wound up meeting these guys in London and South London who were like involved at the time with INLA who started to 
um, who, who they were like in a completely different league from they were like selling a lot of drugs but they were a completely different type of profile to the people that I used to know in Glasgow or, or in Helensburg whereas most of the people I used to know that used to sell a lot of dope and stuff were sort of hippie types they were much more sort of going into a, a sort of serious villain type profile really because they were involved in that but they were bringing in lots of drugs you know lots of drugs manufacturing speed you know so they were involved in a lot of different activities were involved in sort of burglary involved in you know commercial but but also like more serious crime as well and and they took me the some of the well one in particular took me sort of under his wing and then uh, I wound up like like so I wound up just going to him for all the drugs and then I started to make more and more money really from selling drugs uh, I wasn't working or anything like I was just doing that as a as a fool and then uh, but alongside I started to use all the other all the other drugs um, mostly at the time at the start it was mostly cocaine um, lots of cocaine because they were all because they were they were it was a glorified drug they then. were like because they were very heroin was looked upon back then in the 80s mm-hmm. and especially in that type of group of people who were more sort of gangsterish really they would really look down at anybody taking heroin. It's funny that, isn't it? Any addiction, oh, any addictions are the same, but you yeah. uh, kind of frown upon people who take heroin and mm. think, fuck that, but Junkie. it doesn't matter what yeah. uh, drug you take, if you're Aye. taking it every day, you, yeah. you're, a, you're an addict. Aye, if it's absolutely. got the power audio, you're an addict, and it's funny what we label people for a junkie look at the state of that. Aye, when yeah. It's not right, because it's uh, addiction yeah. problems. We've all got addiction problems yeah. for whether it's drugs or whether it's spending money or whether it's your appearance or whether it's even the self-seeking kind of stuff it's yeah there's so many addictions out there it's trying hard to identify it's yeah, difficult yeah but oh there is oh yeah yeah loads of people have got mild addiction like yeah, mild yeah. addictive process or certainly habitual patterns that cause them harm mm-hmm. but they don't want to change it whether it's whether it's di- look at look, we've got the highest rates of diabetes right that there's ever been we've got the highest rates of credit card debt mm-hmm. what's that i mean right so people are still buying stuff on credit cards but yeah, they can't afford it. But they're fixing. There's something. That's the dopamine when you when you swipe that credit card. That you I, get that dopamine rush again. I, again, I know. And so, Amazon just that hit on mm-hmm. Amazon. Click, 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 click. Yeah. You know, or, or you know, and it's the same with the food. Do you question it? a lot of things now, though? Do you question yourself a lot? Do you still question what you do things for and why yeah. you do it? Ah, uh, yeah. The motivated my motivational fact. Not not to a crazy degree, mm-hmm. but because otherwise you'd just be like all the time. And you don't you just enjoy like, life. Oh, you forget oh, about living absolutely. in the moment. Absolutely, because it is about enjoying life mm-hmm. and about enjoying you know romance and about because you. Go, oh, well, why am I going out with that girl? Or why am I going to get married to that girl? Why am I because you'd start to create a story? Oh, you know, is that me? I'm just fulfilling some sort of deep, you know, Need, yeah. but, but 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 within reason, I, I sort of look, and especially if I start to see something that's going to harm me, any sort of like behavior that that can cause harm. You were talking about womanizing, say, mm-hmm. for example, right? Um, you know, if I'm with one partner. And I start to find myself, oh, you know, there's another therapist. Say I'm in Harley Street, yeah, yeah. And there's another therapist just down the road, or whatever it might yeah, yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. Or why am I want to go out with her for a cup of tea? Mm-hmm. You know, why am I want to go if she was less attractive? If I yeah. thought she was less attractive, it's yourself would I needs. still? Yeah. yeah, that's lust as yeah, well comes exactly. into play. And a lot of people get mixed up between lust and love. Yeah, the love was. I always say that is cheesy. Love is within. It's yeah. a, it's a thing, a place I'm still trying to work on. I'm still trying to. Be at, but again, there's always be as men, we're, we are animals, we're brought on this planet. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. We're, we're perverts in disguise, and we, the way we look at women is if when I speak to a woman, I'm thinking she's attractive, I'm automatically, I'm just yeah. thinking, I want to fuck her, yeah, and I'm going yeah. to be honest at that. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah, yeah. You, that's you need to st- realize that you need to stop thinking that way. I, I, Do you know because what I mean? we've developed, we've as developed as through we've, such I a young developed. age, oh, yeah, yeah. And they talk about subliminal messages and look. Things when you're younger as oh, well, yeah. like showing you pictures and oh yeah, yeah, sex oh, where yeah, you can yeah, be yeah. sex fucking mad. Oh yeah, completely. So it's difficult to, oh, well, to try at, and adjust and yeah. and identify. You right? oh wait a minute, this is wrong. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah. To 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 try and look at people as an individual instead Aye, of the not lost factor. Do you know what I mean? And thinking she's got a nice set of tits or yeah. she's really pretty. Yeah, because, not to objectify. Yeah. Try not to objectify. Mm-hmm. So how do you work on that then? Well, I work on that all the time because what I do is I try and remind myself mm-hmm. all the time. I say to myself, look, 
identify what's going on internally, you know, where I can feel it's quite, it, it, it's became much easier as I went on because I can see, I can see the difference in energies inside me when I get adrenalized by, you know, like when I'm starting to get like, where there's an obsessive element to it or a feel I'm looking for that, that fix or a buzz. A lot of the time when I want to be impulsive, it's coming from a place of fear. It's coming from a place of fear. So it's coming usually from the addiction side of things, you know, where I'm trying to get a fix on something. So so I just like, I mean, I've done lots of different things in the, in the past just to be able, even just writing stuff down around my agenda for things, just to to to, to write down what my thoughts are and what my feelings be are and get it on paper. And then I can see it because when it's in your head and it's just circling around your head, it's really difficult to understand what part are you speaking to yourself? You know, mm. is this the voice of my addict or is this the rational part? Of my, you know, is this the intuitive or instinctive or rational or is this an ad addictive drive? Because my ad the addict part of me is the same voice, you know, is me as well. You know, it's not that's like... that's a chase as well, trying to get uh, a girl on with, yeah. with the thought process. We've oh, got 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, 50,000 uh, to 70,000, yeah. is it 68? Oh, it's crazy, it's a crazy amount. I don't know so what the exact... So you're constantly yeah. battling and trying yeah. to... It's trying to identify, right, why Why is the reasons behind this madness? But yeah. it's a chase as well. Aye, if, we, if we're addicts, yeah. it's a chase. Yeah. It's a chase to try and... I know, but it never stops, doesn't it? Do you right. notice that with... The, Especially with, with, with social media as well, though, because a lot of people are prancing about in their fucking bras and pants yeah. on their photos as well. So there's a lot yeah. of... But that doesn't make it right to be like fucking grueling and, and groveling over yeah. pictures, but it... It looks in your mind, and the first thing that comes to your mind is sex. Oh, 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 yeah, absolutely. But look, look at look at porn addiction, right? Even if we take pornography, right? I've got clean time, right? so I've stopped using porn for it. I mean, it sounds like I'm no, no. A, I'm a monastic, living a monastic life. But I've stopped. I've, I've had years that I've not looked at mm -hmm. porn. But the reason I've stopped doing all that is because that there leads to the same place. It's the same thing. That, I mean, we, you because know, the images uh, in your uh, mind are uh, uh, yeah, you look at women as if they're oh, all the same. Completely. Look, look, we, in our grand, our great grandfathers, we see on a, on, a, on a website and within two minutes, we would see more, not even two minutes, in 30 seconds probably, we see more images, more intense images than our great, great grandfathers would see in their whole life. Do you know what I mean? So why a lot of young people are developing erectile dysfunction is their their first exposure, their first sexual. Whereas years ago, like maybe like in the sixties and seventies, growing up, you would uh, well, it might have been catalogs. Even before that, people ah, would yeah, look yeah, at yeah, catalogs yeah. to get some sort of jolly from. Mm -hmm. But but what would happen is, I, I guess that I mean, what's happening with young people is that they're looking at all this. I mean, since the internet's really kicked off and pornography, live streaming, and all the rest of it. People are getting that they're all the time with dopamine. They're looking at particular images and then they're shifting over to the next image, and they're wanting a more intense, or they're wanting, wanting a more seductive. They're wanting because the same image won't work, keep won't keep working. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? They've got to keep up in it, just like with cocaine or or with drugs. You've got to keep. You get a tolerance. You get you get desensitized to it. So what's happening is young people are looking at images all the time. And then the next thing, there's a girl presents, one of the girls from school or whatever, she's 16 years old, she starts taking her clothes off, but they've just been looking at images where there's anal you know, sex or there's rape scenes mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So it's really intense, sort of quite shame-based, actually, imagery. And they're looking at that, and, and the girl's walking in, the girl takes her clothes off, and they can't get it together because... Mm -hmm because it doesn't meet the criteria. Then they maybe start saying to the girl, well, I want you to do this, I want you to do mm -hmm. that. This is what I want, you know, it's got to be anal sex. I think that's why rape's on the rise and uh, child abuse and stuff like oh, that. Oh. Do you know much about, like, uh, paedophilia and stuff like that? And Because they say it's one in every 30 has paedophile tendencies, so that's like one yeah. in every street. Is that a chemical uh, imbalance? Is that a mental disorder? Yeah, is that yeah, well lots of the lots of paedophilia paedophilia yeah. is also they, they, they make a relationship to the uh, childhood sexual abuse as well. Mm. They like their own childhood they're where they've linked. been aye, that there's links to that as well. There is links to as far as I know, I'm not like an expert just on the, the paedophilia stuff, but 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 it's a sickness, it's an illness, mm. like but 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 the thing for those guys to know, and that's really, really important, is that they should they should be getting they should be 
holding herself accountable as a, as a result for the recovery. They should be going and doing something about it. Going and, and I know it's very difficult. It's a, it's a touchy like, subject. I know. Jink, there's, it, it's bad enough people to admit they've got cocaine addiction or gambling Aye, addiction. Yeah. Oh, if you've got an addiction you want to fuck kids, is, Aye, you I want know. to come forward because it's hanging them, burn them, I know. Keep shoot them, I and know. it's difficult. I know. And I'm not, listen, Aye, I kids, know. Anybody Aye, exactly, you exactly, mean, exactly, exactly. I know. It's a touchy subject where is there enough place for people to come forward and get help? Is there enough... I, I, things there for people to speak up because as soon as you speak up about that you're going to get yeah, your back turned on you massively. you know what I mean so yeah. it is a chemical imbalance it is a mental addiction it's a mental yeah. disorder where I don't know if there's enough things in place I but don't it's think something that I maybe look into and, and um I, yeah, and, and, and see if there's a lot of things in place for people to come forward because if there's, if there's one in every 30 that's a fucking that's a people. big percentage it's a lot of people and the, I don't know anybody that spoke out about it. I don't know anybody yeah. that's came forward and saying I've had. I think there was a man on Twitter who says he had the thoughts, never acted on it. Yeah, but yeah. used to watch his neighbours' kids and stuff, and yeah, or yeah. his family's kids, something like that. But it's a, it's such a touchy subject that nobody wants to touch on. Yeah, yeah. because it's you're getting scrutinised as a beast, and and I get it. I fucking totally yeah. understand, but. Yeah. Is there enough places and things in order? Yeah, Cause, for cause them. the numbers yeah. seem to rise. The some the, the rapes are seeming to rise, and is that all yeah. coming from? the platform where people can look at porn and look at girls getting abused yeah getting fucked because let's face it majority of people are in porn as well they're, they're, a lot of them are forced as well yeah so basically oh, oh, watch, absolutely absolutely so if you're watching yeah. that you start to think that's normal yeah so you, know, you just say it's there if I, you're getting a new girlfriend and you're thinking she's I, not up to my criteria because they've been watching I, all the, I, I absolutely. the the bullshit of the day yeah. But that again always comes down to the mindset. What you're watching is yeah. what you eventually become yeah. as well. And it's highly addictive. All the mm -hmm. porn, the porn stuff is highly like 60 addictive. 60% I mean, of people on the internet is, is for porn. Oh, uh, Google. Every, mm -hmm. uh, 50, uh, 50, 50 percent of searches are Google mm -hmm. related. And there's uh, something like 32% of the world. You must have 50% of the world. his hands up the back <laughs> But yeah, no, it's fine. So, uh, uh, shall I tell you about, a bit more? So, so, so you ended up in prison as well in Spain. Uh, uh, yeah, so what happened is then I, I started to, what we started to do because I was involved in we were, we were at the time we were getting LSD crystal uh -huh. from Holland and we were buying LSD crystal for it was about eleven thousand pounds for five grand. We were making LSD basically and we we're taking that we started to take that to Spain and then and what happened in one of the escapades that was in Spain because I knew a lot of travellers back then as well to, from there used to be a travelling city like uh, travellers called the convoy. So what what happened is we took. I was taking some acid, not not a great amount, um, across to to Spain to start to do these contacts with these people. To there was a, a person I met in Morocco, so I was smuggling dope from Morocco, bringing hash from Morocco back to England. How are you bringing it? We was just doing suitcase back then. It was just really easy because you could just put it in a suitcase, in a plane? literally on a plane. I because there was no. I mean, back then there was no even India. Right, what we used to do, we used to go from uh, we used to go from India straight into Schiphol in, in Amsterdam. And you could put five or ten kilos in your in your suitcase, and no one, you, you know, even if you got caught, you in Amsterdam especially, they just kept you maybe a cut. Well, if it was, was over five class kilos, was there? Was I, it, was it was a, a classes in Amsterdam? Uh, not class B. I think it was a class B, but it was it was decriminalised in Holland anyway. Slap so the there was coffee shops, mm -hmm. and so I. Uh, so what's that, this anyway I was in Morocco met this girl this girl said to me oh you should go to the, the, meet this guy down in the south of Spain down in Marbella well, in Fingarola he's got a bar there he'll be interested in selling you hat, swapping LSD because they'll 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 send some of the LSD out to the Canary Islands. Da, da, da. So this is what we started to do. And then what happened is I wound up in this bar in uh, the cave, it's called the cave in Fuengarola and I'd taken a couple of traveller friends of mine across just as, as a freebie I just thought that I had money and I says look I had a gold MasterCard and a Visa card that had came from a burglary uh, that this guy had gave me and I um, I gave him some drugs for the credit cards and, and anyway so I, I was in Spain I was in I'd set up this deal with this guy the next day I had only a couple of hundred with me but I had much more in my, my rucksack and um in this bar, and then uh, so we're, so the clash are on. We're all we're all dancing. There's a clash. Wrote the Casbah song on. We had like dancing dancing along, and every time we turned round, our bottles of San Miguel kept going missing. So 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 there were so there was people stealing our bottles. Every time we just put our San Miguel on the bar, they would go missing. So my friend Sprague said to me, "I says you know the next um, he says give us fifty of them trips the the acid." And so he just flung, he took it to him and he flung in. So we got eight bottles of San Miguel and he flung two or three in each each bottle trips. 
So what happened is the people were stealing the drink. Uh, they obviously drank the, <laughs> the thing, right? But <laughs> there was a 16-year-old girl who was part of it. So it was a couple of boys, a couple of brothers or so, and and the and the sister. So she got the thing, mate, and she was 16 years. She started flipping it. So I didn't know any of this was good because I just gave him the acid. I carried on dancing. I never really thought much about it. And the next thing, Sprogs it, it, um, turned round and he's... Uh, He's when he's he's turned around and he's he's um I see him going out the bar I see him going out the bar like and I see him he like so I see him pointing at these guys and the next thing he walks out this bar and and I come out so I so I look and I see them following him and the next thing I come out and Sprog's on the deck with these like these lads are are beating the shit out of him really so I jump in but my other friend when the guys are taking the leather jackets off. Uh, to have the fight, my other friend stole their jackets, <laughs> took their jackets, and walked away with their jackets. So anyway, what happened was, the, the, long story short, the 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 boys found that the, the leather jacket didn't have the leather jackets, so they phoned up the guard of Seville. They came, they nicked us, they flung me in the car, they flung me in one car. Well, they flung three of us in one car, and they flung my other friend in one car, and they took us to uh, the Nick and Fingarola. But what I'd done was the acid that I had, as I got in the car, when I got in the car, because there was three of us in the back seat, this was the Guardia Seville, uh, were driving the cars, I just took the acid out of my, my back pocket, really, because it was blotting papers, and I just pushed it down the back of the car seat. And I went to do the same with the Gold Master on the Visa card, but the policeman turned round, the Guardia Seville turned round and went, what you, Capasa, what are you doing like that? So I put that back, and I just, and then we got out of the car, and they never searched the car. Uh, and so so I just had the gold MasterCard and the Visa card. But my friend my friend who was in the R card, he got nicked with 400, they found the 400 trips, but they never even then searched the car. So I wound up, long story, I wound up uh, in, a, in a prison in, Ma in Malaga called Alaran del Toro. And this was 1980, so this is 1987. And what, what used to happen then, a lot of the gangsters who were involved in a lot of the, you know, who were doing a lot of the armed robberies in London, um, well, some of the Brinks Mark guys had all, already moved to Marbella. So a lot of the sort of gangster types had seen that there was a lot of money in cannabis, right? A lot, and especially coming from Morocco, bringing, because it's a small crossing from Morocco to the south of Spain. So they were bringing, they were, they were bringing tons of hash. So you could buy, say you buy the hash in Morocco right at the source, it's a hundred pound a kilo. But if you were buying it on quantity, if you're buying half a ton or, or 400 kilo or whatever it would be, you're getting it maybe 50 pound a kilo and then you're selling it in the south of Spain for 500. But they were also bringing it back in and they were bringing it back in furniture and bringing it back in England and then selling it for 2000 pounds. So... So I, I wound up meeting a whole group of guys. It was it was mad because was, there was 12 dormitories and there was one dormitory and it was all Scottish, English and Irish and there was a couple of Dutch there. And so every day I'd go into the courtyard and we'd, we, they would be like, oh, I got nicked, I was on the boat. There was I had half a ton or a two ton or I'd, you know, and the boat, there was too much weight on the boat and the boat and we hit a storm and the boat started to sink, you know. And there was these mad, and I'd just Stories. sit there. And, I'd, and then I got contacts. So what would happen is, and this is the thing about prisoners, it, it never done anything to rehabilitate me. All it done really was it just introduced me to a whole group of other international like, smugglers that I networked yeah, that I networked and because I'm quite sociable and like I chat with people like I just got to know more and more people and and uh, so then when I came out of and then I got out of prison uh, I, got, well, I got out on bail and they gave me the night that they gave, they gave me bail they gave me my face because I actually it's mad because because a couple of days into the sentence this guy came in to our dormitory and we, me and my friend were the only English Scottish people in the in the dormitory. It was all Spanish, and it was a mad it was a mad dormitory too because this wasn't the English Scottish. This was all Spanish. The one that we got put into the initial dormitory we got put into, and so there was guys in there who were like etta separatist separatist. Uh, they were like bringing in tons of hash guns involved in a lot of serious crime. And uh, anyway, so we, we, you know, we were in there, and then uh, this this guy comes in. And he says, "Oh, I've just been arrested," and he comes straight and he can speak perfect English. And he says, "Oh, I've just been arrested. I was in a car. When I got out the car, 
uh, they searched the car and they found the LSD and you know and and and, and I, <laughs> I was like, you're, you're, I says I I said well, well what I said I says that's t-. I said well what I said well, he says what first of all he says what are you in for and I says I'm in for plastic I was credit cards he says what's your friend in for I says he's in for acid LSD and he says how what what's the design on your friend's LSD I says well he because I, I knew because we'd made so it was circles it was white light sort of white lightning they used to be called back then but the blotting paper so I, I said but, and he says oh this is the design on mine and he'd done these purple ohms and I knew the purple ohms were mine because I got them in Holland and brought them back so so I just went oh, that's terrible man I, I, mm-hmm. I can't believe I, I can't believe that and then and then he was gone in a couple of days and I, and I, and I still to this day I think was Sounds he a, a copper? Plant? Yeah, yeah, but then I think, why would they put a pla- why would they put a copper in? Because put them right into the lion's den, you know, like in case you know in the dormitory, there's seventy or eighty people in the dormitory. So um, was there fingerprints of that then? I, I that's what was really paranoid at the time. I was like, oh my god, what was my it? Pencil? 80s? I eighties, and I, I had it in cling film, so it was cling film, and I kept asking everybody, do you reckon there'll be, you know, do you reckon there'll be like prints on it? And they were like, oh no, don't worry, it should be fine. Anyway, they were gone. I got I got out, I got bail. Uh, I got bail and I never went back to Spain for years I only told about as I was saying in the car but six years ago I went back for the first time I checked out that there's no there's no it was all paper files way back then and um, to see if you had to still want to yeah and then I, and then I just like what happened is the money I mean really the long and short of it really is the money the, the lifestyle because a lot of it is about the lifestyle about the ego about, and it's all back to that. Addiction. What to, aye, exactly. It's like wanting to get that kudos or prestige mm. from being a drug dealer or a smuggler. It's all about, oh, you can, that somehow I'm elevated in your mind that I'm, because I'm like thinking I'm not enough really. Is your that sense of importance? Yeah, I've got some sense of importance. And I think I, I, I get the impression that is generally what it is with most people. And eventually all the money, all that I lost all the money, the girls, uh, the, get, the uh, jewelry, uh, 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 all of it, all, all, of, goes. It, all of it all goes. goes, and then eventually I was a street home. I was a street addict on the street, nothing. And how did that come about when you I, were I, living the high life I, and because, all in Spain? Because what happened is I got I got ostracised. Because what happened is my best friend died when I was twenty five, and then I got sort of ostracised ostracised by a group of people around his death because they wanted to blame. Because I found his body when I was twenty five. He died there an overdose. Oh, ODE, yeah, yeah, and and I found him, and then from there, uh, the F, the, the C, uh, CID were involved. They they sort of somebody had said gave information that I was a drug dealer, that I was involved in drug dealing. So anyway, I, I couldn't sell drugs anymore, really, because I was get, really getting watched. Um, I got ostracised, but also the the Irish, so the Irish lads too who hated heroin when they found out my friend had died of a heroin overdose. They sort of says we don't want. Well, they wanted to know the person that gave them the heroin. They wanted to kneecap basically the person that gave them the the heroin. And I I, I was getting the heroin still from this guy, so I didn't want to give him the the, the mm-hmm. name. And I got ostracised for them. So then I then then I had a raging at that by that time I had a raging heroin habit, and. But I had a chunk of money and I thought, well, what I'm going to do now is if I'm going to, if I can't sell, if I can't make money, I'll just go to India where to the source. We'll go to the Golden Triangle, Thailand, Burma, India. I'll go right up in there and it's peanuts. So I wound up going there, getting a a, a motorbike, going driving away into the... Just, just, just into the, the the hill tribes, really, in the in the north, right in the north, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai, right into the where the border is, and the heroin there, they call it number four white heroin, and it's the pure, pure, pure. It's like you could, but I was cranking, I was, so I was janking it up, and you would you die just, if you took it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have could to die. cut it. Oh, yeah, well, you would, if you came back here, you'd have to cut it severely because it would be like I don't know what I don't know what the the maximum strength, but it's very pure. You just put cold water. You just what put colours it. It's white. It was white mm. heroin. I've seen lots of different colours. I mean, like in I mean most of most of the stuff that's in India is brown sugar, mm. but brown heroin, and and the stuff that came a lot of that was produced in Iran and Afghanistan, obviously. But and in different countries you get different like in Malaysia when I was in Malaysia you get this the heroin was sort of an orange a really orangey not like the colour you're jumping about which is red but it's it's like an orangey cut really mm-hmm. like and it was really really pure but this stuff in northern Thailand and I just wound up in this little village 
I mean, I was the only. It was mad, really. I was just in this village. Did you just and wing it? No, wing it? No contacts. Just go there. I just go. Just go. Just got on the motor. So what I did is I was there in Bangkok because what I started to do was I just started to bring a uh, hash from India, like just swallow it, just sw so you could get a bit of kilo in your belly. So I'd swallow the, the hash. I mean, it's mad. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a mad story, right? Once, uh, once, uh, <laughs> once, uh, once I. Uh, I, I, I was like, take, so I was like, um, so I was bringing in hash in, in, into Bangkok, but I had a heroin habit at the same time. And heroin is like, it's, it's, it constipates you, right? So 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 what I'd done was somebody had said to me, look, uh, you know, if you put baby, if you, uh, uh, if you dip it in beeswax, right? If you dip, so each 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 Bollinger, right, of hash, say it's a two gram lump of hash, and you put cling film around it. If you dip it in beeswax, then that puts another layer on it. And they they also said to me, I mean, it's not just speculate. This is just made up by people. I mean, there's no evidence based to it really. But he said to me, listen, each the stomach acids go through in 24 hours, one layer of cling film. So if you've got two layers of cling film, that's two days, right? And and if you put the dip it in beeswax, then that might be an odd day or whatever, right? So anyway, I get to Bangkok, but I've got a heroin habit, right? And I know that if I take the heroin. I'm going to not be able to get this because I've got like nearly a kilo and I've got about 850 grams in my, my tummy. So 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 I'm like, but I'm dying for some heroin because I've got a raging heroin habit, right? So I so I go to the I go to the the chemist first and I get laxatives. So I take all these laxatives, but then at the same time I'm shooting up heroin. And then so that day I've no I've not got the heroin out and I and I'm and I start to eat as well. And I'm drinking a Mekong and this Mekong stuff and uh, the whiskey. Uh, and, then, and then eventually, so the next day, I say to myself, right, today I've got to get this stuff out my belly because it's been in here for the So, so I'm, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, so my head's saying, right, okay, but my head's saying, like, oh, but you've got, you've got 48 hours with the two layers of cling film and you've got this beeswax things. But what has happened is the, the beeswax, because I'd used this beeswax, which was the worst idea ever, I don't recommend it end if they're ever thinking this, but don't have anybody ever do this. But <laughs> So what happened was I wound up, uh, the next day passed, I used some more heroin, so I'm still constipated. But the third day, right, my belly, it's, honestly, I just couldn't, but because the bees, beeswax, it, it all congealed, it all stuck. That's one. As, uh, like, uh, yeah, so when I was trying to push on the top, <laughs> I couldn't get it out. And it, it, it was just, it was just a mental, I mean, I, I mean, I remember this one night, I, 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 on the third, I mean, this is nuts, on the third day, on the third night, about two o'clock in the morning, I'm in this hotel room and I'm like in pain, but I can't go to the, I can't go to the hospital because if I go to the hospital, you get in the jail. Aye, exactly, right, and it's, th it's Thailand, man, it's like, you know, you could oh, get a life sentence, life, right? <laughs> no, I mean, like, so what I'd done was, I, I, was, I was sitting in the toilet, you know how they've got these hoses, they've got these like, like, so they've got the, just a hole in the ground and then they've got a hose, I was thinking, because I could, I, I could understand it, it all stuck, so I just stuck, I stuck this hose up my arse and put on the thing to try and break it down, the, the, the thing, and then what happened is it oh it it seemed to work right because with the pressure I don't know with the pressure it felt really uncomfortable obviously because and then I and then I I I basically next thing that it, it all started to come out not inside the toilet but just beside the toilet and then I, I looked down and there was a Timex watch right that somebody had somebody had left a watch an old Timex watch and I remember like looking at the watch and thinking. And I grabbed it and I thought, what a result, I found a watch, you know, and it's just a mad, I'll just never forget it because it was just like, you know, I was in absolute pain, I'm doing this thing and putting myself in such harm and you know, potential to go to jail, but yeah, I find this watch and I think it's like Christmas, you know. Mm. Um, how much, So how long would it normally take you to do the toilet and get a kilo shot out? Oh, you could do it, you could you could get it all out within it like, if you... Uh, Ah, oh no, you could get. You know, if you just went to the bathroom, just you'd get it all out. You know, I mean, you making good money. No, no. What it was, what no, no. The, well, if you brought it back to England, you'd mm. get. If you were bringing it straight back, you'd make only a couple of grand. I mean, this is mm. the thing about all this, James. It's like at the end of the day, what I was doing, I'd I'd run out of money, and I was just like doing this stuff to just survive. Like all the money sort of went on because I was in Goa and I was taking coke in Goa and. So all the money had gone and then I was just like, it was just like doing these things just to get survive. the money to survive, just pure survival, but going, but, but absolute recklessness and not 
not caring about myself, you know, because ultimately what happens is you don't care about yourself. You don't, you've just, it's dereliction. You've walked out on yourself, really. And then, um, so then if I, f so, so that. When did you come back to the UK then? How did you, did you end up homeless? Over there I, first or the UK first? I wound up in India for a couple of years and then I couldn't get any more visas and I had to come back and then I smuggled some heroin back quite a bit of heroin in my, uh, the, uh, inside again, back to England. And uh, I mean, that's great. I mean, that I, I, I could have completely. And this is the thing about this is if I think about how many times I've overdosed, how I, I, I shouldn't be here. There's no way the things that's happened to me, I've been stabbed, I've had guns in my head, you know, I've, not even just the things that I've done to myself, the amount of overdoses, the amount of drugs I've had in my body, bringing it across, about, you know, going into Thailand with loads of heroin, going into Malaysia, death pit, like, I remember going through the borders and it's da da means death, drugs means death, and sitting on the back of the bus sniffing heroin, and there's a big sign saying, if we catch you with drugs, drugs, you're, you're going to be killed, you know what I mean? Or, or, and it's but do you think so, that again comes back to the oh, youth you for the adrenaline you've craved that that's a turn on oh mm -hmm. death of drugs mm -hmm. so I'm just going to sniff a bit of gear yeah. behind a copper yeah, yeah. just for that buzz that I could yeah. get killed but that's what I need because if yeah. I don't have that buzz then my life feels like shit yeah yeah, yeah. it's just I don't feel alive unless yeah. some, I, I don't feel truly alive that's the thinking is that I don't feel truly alive unless there's the threat of death, mm -hmm. unless I could die any moment so when you come back to the UK come back to the UK yeah. and, uh, like, then I sold it the girl I was with at the time, she was smuggled, right, so she used to get so she was parcels. Smuggler. She smuggled some, yeah, yeah. So I was going out with this girl, she was a Jewish girl, she's dead now. Lots of the people I was around are dead. Overdose. Are dead. Overdose. Suicide. Suicide. Uh, the usual suspects uh, if I, you're dabbling. Yeah, absolutely. And so she was getting, we were getting parcels, she was getting parcels sent across. I wound up then going to Israel with her because she got nicked. Uh, uh, so we wound up, I wound up going to Israel with her and then, um, I'm in Israel and uh, try to clean up. I was going to go in a kibbutz, but that never really happened because I found in Israel, I found heroin half the price of what it was here and better quality. So we just wound up using uh, in Israel. And then I came back and then it was about another four years of just pain, just being on the street, just like, you know, and that's why the big issue and stuff, you know. Let's so you involved in the big issue. Big issue. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. I'm a trustee, mm -hmm. the big issue. I've been a trustee for a few years now. So and when did you, so what, then, everything you've came through, all the abuse, mm. uh, mentally, physically, drink abuse, drug abuse, prison, Spain, yeah. even prison in Scotland, mm. to being homeless, Aye. to nearly dying, being stabbed, guns in the head. When did you go? Yeah, so, fuck this. I, well, I'm changing. Well, I had to. I, like, it's not what age were you? I, I, I was 32, so I never get clean till I was 32. And I think I could. Uh, uh, well, that, I got it when I got. I got recovery when I've got. Uh, I got it, but but at 32, I'd absolutely was smashed. You know, like I'd I'd was at a, a absolute rock bottom, and I thought. Um, I was suicidal. I was absolutely suicidal every day. I was thinking, I just want to kill myself. And then what happened is. I got arrested, wound up in Belmarsh, and I got shorts. I got like the motivation was to avoid my mo what happened to get. I got clean, but the motivation to get clean was coming from a place of that to avoid a prison sentence, to avoid this maybe three year sentence. But actually, I wound up going into a rehab. So I wound up getting into a rehab in London, and, and I really thank the NHS, man. Really, like, if it wasn't for back then funding, and I know in Scotland it's really, you know, if. Um, funding's really, really, really tight in Scotland, and they don't really put enough money into um, rehabilitation at all. They put a lot of money into methadone here and stuff. But, but anyway, uh, I wound up in this in this rehab, uh, a detox, and near where I live now, and I, 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 I think I had a rock bottom. I was really, and I was, my ego was deflated enough for me to have humility to, to know that I need help. I can't do it on my own. Like I need to get some help. And it just happened that the people were there at the right, like I got into the rehab. And then when I was only like two weeks clean, I went to a, a there was a, a sort of 12 step music night thing and, er, and Eric Clapton came in. So what happened is I, I was there with this friend who's also dead, Alan. And he said, that's Eric Clapton that's just walked into the, the, the venue 
and I and it was a crappy little church hall, right, where they were doing this event. They were doing this music thing. It was about 100 addicts who were all sort of in recovery. And there was a music thing going on. They were, were doing, And he walked in and he stood at the side of this. There wasn't even a stage. There was just a step going up. And he stood at the side, played his instrument. And, and what was mad about it was when I was a kid, the two posters I had on my wall were Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, both of which I've met and both, both well, I mean, Eric, I don't, I, I, I've known, I've only met twice, but Jimmy I've met several times. But, but um, what happened is that he, uh, so he, he, I went up and started to speak because my friend said, oh, could you get me his autograph? Right? You're not meant to get autographs from Twitter. You're not meant to go and ask like Especially celebrity like people. Ah, stuff, yeah, 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 exactly, right. But so I didn't know I was all naive to it. So I went up and I started to speak to Eric and he said, he says, where are you? Are you? And I says, I'm in the rehab, I'm in a detox just up the road. And he was like eight years because he'd went through that tragic thing with his son dying yeah. and, you know, and got through that whole thing clean. And so, so he, he was like, really like, Oh, that's good that you're there. He was like, he's humble, really humble and, and, and really compassionate. And, and I came out of that event and I thought, what a buzz, man. What a buzz that I've just met this, this sort of like celebrity that, you know, and, but, and that, but what it was, was not so much about what meeting him was just the fact that I could have fun when I'm clean, that I could actually, after letting go of drugs and alcohol, I could actually have fun and enjoy myself. And I had a good night that night listening to the music and, and was completely clean. And, you know, and I guess what happened from that, that just really drove this uh, ambition in me to remain clean. It didn't happen because cause at the beginning it's difficult because my head, the, 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 the demons so strong. And the demons. And it, it's going, come on, you can just do it mm -hmm. one more time. Mm -hmm. You just like have a drink, you can drink, you can smoke a puff, mm -hmm. right? Do dope was like a big one was saying, oh, you could just smoke a couple of joints. You, you know, you had a problem with heroin or coke or crack or, but you know, you don't really, you could go back to the days where you just smoked a bit of weed. That's where but, it starts. And yeah, then you need oh, heavier stuff to, to create that dopamine because yeah. eventually when you smoke enough, you, you yeah. don't get that buzz. You mm. need to jump from addiction to addiction. Mm. So when you can, when you, because you've listened to your story and to, to now having a clinic in Harley yeah, Street and yeah. rubbing shoulders with the biggest names in yeah. the world and, it's, it's, a, it's some fucking story. How did yeah. you become, so... What, so what, what I done was I went to school. So yeah. then, I, then I got, like, I thought, right, uh, I, I met a counsellor. My counsellor back then was from here, from Easter House as well, Tony. And he was like, he said, he was like saying to me, you know, just stay clean. You've got to stop gambling as well. Gambling was was came up. As soon as I put down the drugs, not gambling was the next one that came up because gambling was underneath as well. You like, replace it. I, exactly. So I had to stop gambling. I, uh, the last bet was on the Cheltenham Gold Cup. That was like 22 years ago. And, and so, um, but, uh, that, so what, what I, he, 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 he'd been a therapist. So he was a therapist and he had all these qualifications. And I just modelled really what I've seen other people. By going to 12-step groups, I started to see other people who'd really changed their life around, who'd really like, who were a bit further down the road, who were like two years or three years clean. And they they were working now, productive members of society, taking responsibility, were getting married, having children. And I started to think, well, that's what I want. I want all that stuff, really. And how am I going to do it? I need to... I need to identify my own like the stuff that I talked about at the start is like having the addiction is like having a twin that resides inside that it's like having a flatmate who never goes out it's always that that, that addiction is there but it's just not as powerful as it used to be so the idea is is to know thy enemy isn't it to know to get more awareness of myself and to know my addiction as much as I can to protect me from it's like that mafia scene and uh, keep your enemies keep your, your friends enemy, close and your, your enemies, enemies even closer. closer well my enemy I guess is my you know and I, although it's got a positive aspect to it but if it goes into a destructive aspect it's really it, it'll kill me do you know what I mean mm -hmm. fundamentally and it does it kills people continually doesn't it Amy Winehouse you, you, the, the list is massive isn't it and it continues to happen so so he so I started to realise okay I need to get really familiar and then I started to do counselling courses uh, Terrain has been a therapist and then I became quite addicted to like just bettering myself Educating academically yeah yeah, yeah yeah so i just done one like after another i won uh, uh, adult learner of the year award down in bournemouth i was in a rehab in bournemouth uh 
I, I, I done a, a, a diploma in family therapy, an NLP diploma, a degree, a foundation degree in management. I, then it, it, it slowly over time, I started, I was working and then I started to manage services and then bigger services. And then I, and then I done a traumatology to be a traumatologist, a postgrad in traumatology. So I've just kept on doing things to better myself academically. Mm. But at the same time, I understand you as well. I understand me as well, but also realizing that my my addiction as well, even even if it's not an outward symptom as in drugs and alcohol, but it won't there's a part of me that wants to try and restrict me and keep me small. And being aware that it can it, it uses procrastination, it uses a number of different tools. A part of me now I know it's, it's this is part of the human condition as well, but there's a part that will hinder me from achieving goals. So what I started to do was I said, right, okay, well, what, I, I'd done a goals list and said, right, okay, well, what do I want to achieve? I want to write a book. So then I, I thought, right, okay, I need, to, I need to write a book. I want to write, I want to get, bring these people onto paper. I, I met Pete Townsend, way back, Pete Townsend had a, 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 I used to go to a meeting and he was at the meeting and we, used to, we were speaking, he was part of a publishing house. He heard my story. He said, listen, you've got to get this on paper. You've got to get it on paper. And his, that, him saying that was really, I mean, I've, I've, like I gave him a, a sort of a, a, a thanks in the book, but basically then I sort of started to write the book and, and at the same time, my dad died when I was writing the book and I got my dad's agreement to put him in the book and, you know, like, and, and stuff. And uh, I got a book and then what I'd done was uh, I had a book launch and I got I got Jim. There was just people, people it all came to the book launch, which was which was amazing. And and then I just targeted all the newspapers, TV, and then got on tele, you know, and done, like, I had this campaign, really, to get the media, and then the books were selling, like, it was in the it's Daily Rex. So, and then from that was like, okay, what's next, what's next? And then it was, a, I know, about a couple of years later, okay, what are you going to do in Harley Street? What, you know, and just continued, uh, you know, Expanding continue to build growing. your life, really. How do you feel now, internally? How do you I, feel? I, how do I feel? Yeah. Well, 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 when I think about from where I came from, I feel such gratitude that, mm -hmm. I mean, absolute gratitude that, you know, from the murk and mire of active, active addiction to the pain and misery that, that it took me to, which it, which it always will if you've got an addictive personality. It doesn't go anywhere. You know, there might be some glamour for some time, but eventually it always goes down. Even if you've got all the money and stuff, it's still, you, you know, it's, it's about your emotional. Truly, yeah. Absolutely. not going to truly satisfy at, you. Absolutely. Because look at a lot of the rocks. Now, look at the people who have got, you know, they've mm -hmm. not got consequences mm -hmm. like I have trying to smuggle drugs. or But they've but they've wound up, like, they, they've got masses amount of money. But they stop because they hit an emotional rock bottom that they can't do it anymore. It doesn't work. The drugs, like the Verve song, isn't it? The, the drugs, drugs don't, don't work. work. So, yeah, so how I feel now is great. It's uh -huh. great, I, but 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 I still, you know, on a daily thing, I, I don't have any obsessions with drugs or alcohol. I've not had any obsessions mm -hmm. with drugs or alcohol for for a long, long, long time. So I don't get that. But I can see how how that addictive drive can can in a negative way could sabotage. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've got to be really careful doing work that I don't work all the time. You know, like become workaholic. Oh, yeah, or, yeah, yeah. You know that I. It's finding balance. Mm. To spend time with your kids the important things. Yeah, in my life. children. Because, my children are me. Yeah, yeah, to find balance and and no realise that work isn't everything as well because we forget sometimes we can concentrate on the finishing line too much. We forget yeah. to actually live in the present moment and enjoy life. Because I know you're, you're good friends with Russell Brand as well. Yeah, well, I'm friends with Russell. Yeah, yeah, and because mm -hmm. so, I've, so I've known like like a lot of the people that I, um uh, I've created friendships with. I've known them from quite a while, you know, because I'd, because like Perfection. I've just met them. Yeah, yeah, and and we, you know, and um yeah, you know, because he's done a foreword in the book and all mm -hmm. that as well. Yeah, so so it's 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 like because. It doesn't matter what it doesn't. This is this is a, it. doesn't matter what your your you know your your sort of out, outward appearances or your your statuses, uh, or you know it. Addiction just destroys uh, you know anyone that, mm -hmm. that that has an addictive personality. So so um, I guess you know I've been really what what I think about that is I've been really really fortunate. It's it's I've had such an interest in life. You've been you blessed. Know? Oh, completely. But blessed. again, you've yeah. kind of got to thank everything yeah. 
because if it, you didn't do all that, then you wouldn't be helping people mm. survive the now. And I think you've got to hit rock bottom and trauma to yeah. realise that, wait a minute, I've got more to give. Yeah. I can change my life and you're your your prime example that you can change from yeah. being drug smuggler and addicted Aye. to everything, homeless. Yeah. And you've done it. You have yeah. done you've done it. So you've got Aye. to give yourself so much credit. Which you you've yeah. got, you you do anyway. I yeah. Your clinic thought, itself, what what stuff do you do in the clinic? Well, well, that, well, I, well that's just a, a clinic. It's just all people with addiction the different you is know. Is it all addiction. spiritually? Is it any medication? Or is there no, I don't I, I don't prescribe in it because I'm not a doctor, but I, I, I just like it's just all um psychoeducational and counselling that I provide and, and some trauma work you know like because so a lot of times that a lot of the clients that come and see me if you if you take away the drugs not, if you take away the outward behaviour when you go back to the root of it you can see that there's been trauma and and, and early childhood is that I mean, then, a lot, our, then our child yeah yeah then their child started because a lot of, I mean a lot of the people that I've witnessed and I see and, and there's, a, there's a lot of what I recognise is there's lots of public who have been through the public school system really who have it's a different type of emotional neglect because they've just been sent away by their parents to a public school and then there's maybe been some sexual abuse but maybe even if there wasn't sexual abuse they've issues. been abandoned they've been abandoned so they might have had all the material trap they might have had everything to spoke you know like they might be in Eton mm -hmm. or they might be whatever you know in Oxford or but yet at the same time I mean, I guess the, I, I, I guess the difference is: do you want to be abandoned, emotionally neglected, in a, a council estate in Easter House, or do you want to be <laughs> abandoned in yeah. Barbados? Or it's, something, you know but it's, it's hard it's to still raise. The same it's hard system. to raise the perfect kid. It's hard to be the perfect parent because mm. we don't know. As human beings, we don't know what the right way is. We just know Aye. deep inside what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. We can't. There's there's plenty of people in private schools who. Are, I've got biggest I, addictions in the world. There's plenty I, of people yeah. from. I, you like yourself came from rock bottom to change their life. Yeah. yeah. Do you need those? that life experience to become that person that you should be yeah. because it's hard to give somebody everything, kids everything, give them all the, yeah. everything, but they're, they're missing that love, they're missing that affection. That's where you will tamper with drugs to get that connection where you feel loved or feel important yeah. or maybe get an abusive relationship and crave that father figure. Or it's, it's, it's weird to, what would you say was the right way? No, there's no right We've or got wrong it, way. I, what I, would you say I, for a person who was trying to be a better version of themselves yeah. to better their life who had who had addiction problems or problems to be yeah how would you, what advice would you got, give? I think yeah definitely to get to start to look now we've got so many resources online I mean even this even this what you're doing here mm -hmm. James is brilliant work like around doing the you're, you're providing this sort of educational stuff really information about how to change, you know be bringing mm -hmm. on various guests I think by by trying to research try to, for the person to try and reach out and to ask for help it's really important that first step or going to drug service I mean like there's loads of services Services out here, even in Scotland, really, you've got you've got like places that are non-funded, like so where you don't, you just need funding from the government, like Jericho House, or you've got other places like Abercare Scotland, which are like private funded where you need money to go go into it. But but there's lots of types of drug service, there's lots of drug services that are available. Um, and but going and, and speaking with somebody too is really really important. But also to know that there's loads of self help groups. It's you know which is a free resource. So there's like lots of different twelve step groups. But there's also other forums that you know like Smart and stuff like that too, which is in Scotland as well. Which are which are like self help groups, which are uh, which are different in a way because they they don't have a they have they use cognitive behavioural tools really for people to get. Uh, clean and sober or, or address gambling or whatever it is so just to it, I think it's very important for people to know that they're not alone man because it's the isolation and it's the shame that keeps people stuck in addiction you know really uh, and and the pattern of behaviour so to know that they can get help but the, the first thing they've got to do is they've got to realise they can't do it on their own we need we all need to to, to, to get that initial help from someone that then that can model good good behavior you know like and then from there you can it stay stay, stay on track and and have a completely different way of life mm -hmm. excellent i love it before we finish up what was the I, the thing we spoke about earlier kinetic the, the thing oh, the, uh, epigenetics yeah yeah it's really important the epigenetics so uh, it's good to, it's good to i uh, good to research some of that stuff because what they're trying to say, what they are saying now, the latest sort of scientific data uh, 
uh, evidence base really is that they're saying that epigenetic that we can change the genetics, right? So, so if we've got predisposing genes, so for example, me and you, you, you know, family of addiction, you know, we've got uh, we've got a predisposing gene factor, but they're saying that the environment, the environment, seventy percent of what makes that that can turn that gene on or off is the environment. So if you were if you were if you were surrounded by an environment, say, or you or it was created, an environment was created that was really sort of nurturing somehow or that um, could provide a completely different message uh, from what you, your sort of genetic code, your, your DNA sort of, your, your, your normal sort of driver, mm -hmm. then that can, really, that can really change whether or not you develop an addictive process. So if you just look up epigenetics and addiction, there's lots of, like there's some TED Talks on there and, and, in the last five or certainly the last five or six years it's became much more pronounced there's more people talking about it and it's really interesting um, have you ever been on TED Talks? no I'm, I, I want to try and get on TED because Talks because you yeah, should yeah. be on that yeah. uh, telling your experience and how to change and how to better your life and I, yeah. everything I talk about is the mindset and yeah. try to be the better version of myself but for your stories it's phenomenal mate really, yeah. good. I really, really enjoyed that today just before we finish up again sorry mate your, I, your no, book The Ongoing Path what's this about? I, that's the self-help book right. that's the self-help book that I've got so and that's just, I, it's just self-help it's just giving tools and, and understanding around how to change addictive processes uh -huh. and that one there the Nothing to nothing Declare, to declare. Is, 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 the, is the biography it's actually called uh, Nothing to Declare Confessions of an Unsuccessful Drug Smuggler mm -hmm. Dealer and Addict mm -hmm. so it, the title sort of tells you all It's just, and that's about the transition that's about coming from that life and then the process of change and getting into recovery really and where can people buy your books uh, they're, they're on Amazon they're Amazon on Am get them out I, check them out I, and I, we spoke about you just gave me these books today but I, we yeah. actually spoke about Alan McGee the Oasis I, yeah, who signed yeah. the Oasis and I, I've actually got Alan in I, you've got him in the show I know it's the brilliant book. so it's I, uh, synchronicity and things are happening and trying to yeah, keep yeah. to better people's life but Mark that's unbelievable great. story that's one of my best podcasts I've done oh, it's honestly, uh, really yeah, good mate really oh thank you your story is great and for what you're doing and what you're achieving now is again mate it's phenomenal and I really thoroughly enjoyed your Aye, and I've loved it story. James it's been great it's been great meeting you cheers mate more, no more to come more, yeah, yes, love it. <laughs> cheers mate thank you Take, thank you bye please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button so you are notified for when my next video goes on my channel you can also catch me on Twitter at James English Zero or Instagram at James English Two or Facebook at James English Eleven you can also download these podcasts on Podbean or iTunes I just want to say thank you to my sponsors, Fire Suppression Scotland and Select Blinds for also sponsoring this episode. For all your fire safety requirements, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, fire risk assessment, fire doors and also CCTV, Fire Suppression have your safety as their main priority. For inquiries, you can contact them on 01698 200 562 or email on info at firesuppressionscotland.org. At Select Blinds, if you want to find something unique, then Select Blinds is a place for you. They take pride in their ability to manufacture blinds to order, using a range of materials and fabrics. They can take your needs, specifications and instructions to use them to create blinds of any colour or style. If you're looking for something that you've seen in a catalogue, then they keep a range of popular blinds in stock, each of which can be modified and sized to fit your windows perfectly. Whatever they're looking for, an individual item or something that's off the shelf, Select Blinds will give you that ideal choice. When you make a purchase at Select Blinds, the delivery and fitting is also free of charge. So for inquiries for Select Blinds, give them a call on 01236 443 636 or drop them a message on Facebook page Select Blinds and Shutters. AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. They offer services from full event planning and management right down to the standalone venue dressing. AM Events strive for 100% customer satisfaction every time from email updates and how about the planning is going, managing the day of the event. They will support you the whole way through. So for more information to make a booking, Pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Their phone number is 0141 237 3020. So pop along or else their social media pages are on Facebook, AM Events and also Instagram at amevents.glasgow.